on video. <laughs> Hi, Suzanne. Can you hear us? I can hear you really well. Hey, there she is. Yeah. There's a little in the back of my head. A little bit of, boy internet has been really bad lately haven't they yeah 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 everybody's doing their thing yeah hey hey i can hear you a little really well okay that's all yeah I need back. I need back. that's a really big delay the facebook thing off okay yeah you're getting two different levels yeah i got it got it okay i got it Okay. Now, can everybody hear Suzanne? <laughs> and Mr. David, how are you, ah, Mr. David? Clear. Hi, Aaron. Mr. David's in the background. And we'll be leaving to do work soon. <laughs> yes. Yeah? Yard work, beautiful, sunny afternoon. Gorgeous. Yeah, what's the weather like? What's the temperature? Um, it's 60s and full of sun. And every neighbor's out wanting to talk to you along your walk. <laughs> Especially if you're an extrovert like David, you could be walking for four hours around the neighborhood, right, honey? Yeah. Yes, just for a simple two-mile walk. Yeah. That's what we've been doing, too. We're Normally, we just kind of hustle by them and, hi, you know, that sort of thing. But now we're like, hey, you're alive. What's up? How are you? <laughs> Yeah, you, you can make conversation about all sorts of things. <laughs> all right, so you're taking off? Yes, I'm taking off. I'm taking your car, and we'll get water and stuff. Happy errands to you. Goodbye. Bye, love. Are you out of here? You want me out of the photo? <laughs> no, we're just saying goodbye to David. No, I was, kicking, he's... I was kicking Aaron out of the photo. I'm going to be oh. in the background during this, trying to do the technical right. support. So you guys well, you pretend both... like I'm not here. <laughs> you can do that. Right. Although, you know, it's always nice to see you. So. Yes, it is nice to see you. <clears throat> so, how is your. Or, actually, I just need to shut up now and let you do yeah, it. Yeah, we're, we're good to go. <laughs> so, um, I can't see anything on my. I, I can see myself up in the right hand corner of Skype, but I'm just assuming that Sarah's there somewhere and. Everything's okay. We, are we a split screen or something? Yeah, we are. Are yeah, you not able to see us? Mm, no, I can't. I can't I see, you. see you. On Skype, but let's see. There's a there was a Skype update today, and um, hmm. no. I can see myself. I mean, I can I can talk without seeing Sarah. I saw her when I had Facebook Live open. Oh yeah. Um, but then I turned it off because of the. You want to um, use my computer to the audio, the reverb. Hey, Mr. Getty. Okay, no, I think we're good. Go ahead, you guys. We'll just. All right. We shut that door. Yeah. Okay. I'll pretend like I can see you, Sarah. I know exactly what you're wearing and what you look like because I saw you on Facebook for like five seconds. <laughs> I'm wearing, um, can we throw, oh, you try throw throwing that? that picture up? Yeah. I'm wearing my lime shoes for, Not that one. nope, lime awareness. Wow. Yeah, because now that it's May, it's time. Yeah. Day one. We are. Got to get going. Here we are. We're going to take the month by storm. <laughs> okay. That's better. All right. Go ahead, ladies. Hi. Ah, nice to be here with you. Yeah, I know. Thank you for agreeing to allow our call to be recorded and broadcast. Absolutely. I wanted to show off my fingernail polish. Can I do that for just a second? Yeah, go for it. There's a reason that I'm doing that. I haven't painted my nails in over three years because I've been so ill. And uh, I got some non-toxic nail polish and painted them yesterday. Yay. For the first time over three years. <laughs> so, 
which feels like a small victory uh, somehow. It is a so. small victory when you have like the time and energy to think about something beyond survival. That's a victory. Yeah. That's right. That's right. We have to do that. So it's pretty exciting. Well, let me introduce you to our listeners. So Suzanne and I became friends through first the podcast and then some coaching calls and she and then I also asked her to come and be a part of Lime Voice on an ongoing basis but her health has continued to go up and down so many people in the Lyme community and chronic illness community understand what it's like to be moving forward in one direction and then end up spiraling downwards at different times and it just seems like there's this ebb and flow um, and you haven't been able to be online voice because you've been taking care of yourself which is the thing you should be doing but every time I talk to Suzanne we have just both gone through so many hard layers of decision making for so long and what the world is experiencing with COVID-19 the financial chaos, the unknowns, the living in either fear or panic or living with something else controlling a lot of your time, it changes your reality on on a daily basis. And so when you have chronic illness and you can't control your symptoms, you do have to make really, really hard decisions over and over again. And it's decisions that in most of my two-hour coaching calls that I do with people, it's how do I do everything that needs to get done? How do I provide financially and meet those physical needs? How do I meet physical needs that have that are sometimes multiple trips a month to a specialist or multiple trips a month to the ER or whatever it is? And so that process is just so unique to people who have been in it for a long time. And Suzanne, you guys have been in it for a long time. Yeah, yeah, it's it's been over three years. It was three years ago in April that I got the diagnosis. But of course, I was sick long before that and just very gradually declining. Um, so we've been hitting it hard for three years. And I anticipated, of course, being farther ahead than I am. But I'm way farther ahead than where I began. So um, we're in the messy middle, along with a lot of other people, um, but we are finding strength and, and resilience. Um, I understand why your coaching calls are two hours long. People think probably that that sounds excessive, but um, when we begin to um, hear from and come alongside other Lyme patients, the layers of complexity and the amount of decisions are so um, overwhelming that it literally can take that much time to just know the next five things you're supposed to do in order yeah. to keep going. Yeah. So yeah, there's a complexity to it. And one of the things helping us through is we are alongside a lot of other patients that are not dealing with the same exact issues, but the same levels of complexity. So um, we know we're not alone in this crazy Lyme world that we're in, um, and we just keep going somehow, even when it looks like we're not going to be able to anymore. Yeah. So let's talk about that. If you guys are interested in coaching, both Suzanne and I do coaching. Suzanne does a lot of coaching with her support group, and um, I do most of mine online. So if you guys are interested, you can email Suzanne at... Suzanne Burden at gmail.com. And I am Sanchez Smile at gmail.com. And or you can reach me through Facebook. But it is it's so complex because the realities is at like I keep, I've said it so many times on the podcast already. COVID-19 has only been around for a few months and it's shut us down medically and economically. And there's a ton of similarities between how the world is dealing with COVID-19 and how you live as a patient with a chronic illness. Yeah, because there's so much uncertainty. And so as this was beginning to start, I kind of had these feelings, a little bit of anger, like, uh, welcome to my world, friends. Um, you're complaining that you've been home and isolated for a week. Um, it's been three years for me. So, <laughs> um, but then I remembered those beginning feelings 
when um when you know as we were all getting sick and as we were realizing layers and how serious what we had was and so then i was able to be more empathetic and understanding toward people that are be you know just trying to figure it out and um the Lyme patients in our group and in general that have been at this for a while have some ninja level skills that can really help other people through this COVID thing. And that is something that I keep trying to stress in phone calls, on our group Zoom calls, in interactions with some of them is like, remember what you've learned and use all of it right now. It will not only get you through, but it's actually helping other people around you. Well, and the learning curve is just so steep. It's so steep. I mean, I can't even, sometimes in the Facebook groups, there is this sweet girl who had just gotten diagnosed with Lyme, like an acute case. So she hadn't been sick for years and years like some of us, but right away went into the hospital with all these weird symptoms in agony. They started her on doxycycline right away. I don't know, IV drip, which I was like, wow, that's incredible that she got that level of care from an ER. And she's at home and she's five days into it. And she's like, what is happening? Like, when is this going to go away? I feel like death. I can't take care of my kids. There's no way I'm going to work. Like, and to, I mean, when she was basically, she's a weekend and I'm like, oh my gosh, I don't even know how to tell someone like that for those of us who are years in. Yeah. It's like you, you're like, you, you ask yourself, what information does this person need in these moments? Because if I give them everything, they're going to crumble. Um, it's too much. And so what is the next right thing to do? Yeah. And, um, for many of us that are in the middle of it or wherever we're at in it, we, we have to learn to live in the day and the week so much as far as the decisions that need to be made next. Um, my therapist says that's how everyone should live. They should be living in the moment in the day. But with Lyme patients, you are actually forced to do it. So, Sarah, you and I have lived with the level of uncertainty for so long that COVID, it seems like a ripple in the water in some respects. Oh, totally. To us. Like, I'm not afraid of, of getting COVID-19 at all. I have all the tools that I need to protect myself because I've learned enough about viruses and bacteria. Um, and I have things within my home that can keep my immune system strong or I can treat myself with those things. But not everybody has that, right? Yeah. Um, so we have developed this mass of knowledge and it's like, okay, how do we carry it into this new season, which is going to go on for quite some time? And how do we also make people um, more aware of what Lyme disease is? This is the awareness month for the year. And um, my goodness, the globe is turned upside down by COVID-19. But when will the globe be turned upside down by Lyme disease and other tick-borne illnesses that are decimating the lives of so many people? Maybe this is an opening and maybe it's a window. And that's why we have to keep talking about it. Um, if it was just about you or me, we probably would be like, no, I don't really feel like talking about it. <laughs> but because we realize it's about so many people and their health and well-being and welfare, it's like we have to talk about it, right? Yeah, you do. You know, um, I got a text message just this week from a past coaching client and she said, coming out of massive treatment and she said hey i'm <laughs> i'm doing all the protocols how long did you do all these at-home protocols like when is this gonna end and she's a few months out of treatment and i said you know it was a solid two years of six days a week implementing as much as i could whether that was sitting in an infrared sauna, for me, juicing and colonics have been huge, swallowing supplements four or five times a day and taking some supplements with food and some supplements that can't have, be with food and juggling all of that. And, you know, I'm, that's just what it took. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And that is what it takes for most people that reach the, that level of illness. 
And I think what people are beginning to realize, we see some articles coming out in Forbes magazine and some other places, is that this is not a minor thing. It's not like a very small percentage of people that get acute Lyme end up with chronic Lyme disease symptoms. The percentage seems to be a lot larger than anyone ever thought that it was. Even the CDC numbers that they do admit to are large enough to decimate families and lives around the world. Um, so yeah, like we have to bring awareness to it. And for those of us that are still here, we're still living because we took it that seriously to do all the treatments, whatever it took financially, uh, relationally. Um, I have a like a, a, a huge um, paper that I typed up of what I have to do throughout the day to space things out like you were talking about with current treatments and supplements and it's it's a pain like it's like you got to have your phone set to some of the stuff just to keep up with it but it's worth it to save our lives mm -hmm. and if someone were to ask me when will the treatment end I would probably say in a way it never ends because once you get into the Lyme journey and you begin to heal and it's a detox body, mind and spirit, I'm telling you, it's a good journey in the sense that you're going to clean it all out. If you're devoted to it, you're going to want to stay healthy afterwards. So you start learning all this stuff about your body, your mind and your spirit. And then you're like, well, it's not going to be as intense as it was when I was actively treating, but I'm going to continue coffee enemas you know, maybe once or twice a month or once or twice a week. I'm going to continue this amount of juicing. I'm going to continue to eat clean. I'm going to exercise. I'm going to practice good boundaries. Because why would you give that up? You know, you've made such an investment in yourself. Yeah. And you, be you become such a vibrant person and a vibrant tool to inspire other people that they can actually live differently than they're living right now. Even if they don't have chronic Lyme, they don't have to have a serious chronic illness to see that making changes in the way the average person lives their life is beneficial and life-giving and joy-filled. And so for me, I actually see it as an invitation. I think there's an invitation in everything we experience in life. In COVID-19, there's an invitation for the world community community, and for the individual. And in Lyme disease, there's an invitation as well. I agree. And that's, yeah, I agree. There is an invitation uh, at every level and with every turn if, if we're looking for it and if we're willing to accept it and deal with it. I think one of the things that took me a there's so many people out there with chronic illnesses who maybe even didn't have a real diag or a diagnosis. Like there's so many labels and those labels may be helpful in applying for disability or something, but not necessarily like, oh, I think for me, I didn't realize I was fighting for my life for a long time. Like I had chronic fatigue. I had fibromyalgia. I got every cold that came around. I did not realize early on in those years that I was fighting for my life and because I wasn't. I was existing and I didn't know what I didn't know. But. Yeah. Yeah. We almost have to have people um, point it out to us. Um, I think I had people telling me that were close to me that were not that did not have. Um, a healthy emotional outlook or life that I wasn't dying. You know, I was just, you know, sick, but I was going to get over it. And in fact, I was dying. And so um, a year or two later, after I was kind of out of that woods, um, several people said, we knew that you were going downhill. One practitioner said, I went home that night and told my husband, I'm not, I've met a, a today and I'm not sure she's going to make it. She's just too weak at this point. Mm. Um, and so the reality of it hits you later and you're like, oh my gosh, no wonder it felt like I was in the middle of a bog trying to run through thick mud, you know, like, um, yeah, it, it takes every bit of tenacity and you have to have at least one person that sees what's going on and will fight on your behalf. I believe that. 
So it, it, you just have to. Let's talk about that because um, some yeah. people don't have that. Uh, and some people have to become that for themselves. Yes. Right? Um, but you just celebrated an anniversary. Yeah. Yeah. Our wedding anniversary on Sunday, 12 years. 12 years. Yeah. And you shared on Facebook um, how David had said in his card to you that he said, we've laughed together. What was his quote? We've laughed. We've loved. He, he said, I think he said, we, we, we laughed, we loved, we cried, but mostly we endured. I um, got so emotional when I read that. It mm -hmm. just, like, that was the last line of the card. I remember last year, you know, when there's an anniversary or a birthday or Christmas, getting cards from him and he tried to come up with something to write. And I remember <laughs> at one point thinking, I can't wait till the day that he doesn't mention something about how we made it through something so hard and we're only going to come out of it stronger. <laughs> um, because sometimes you feel like it's never going to end. And so um, I think it's been hard for me to believe that there are people like David in the world that are able to stick in there for the long haul of something that's so hard to fight. But that's what he's done. And it hasn't been perfect for the two of us, but we've really, um, we've circled in and, he has grown tremendously through it, um, emotionally, physically, mentally, spiritually, and I have grown tremendously through it. And um, there's something that can happen when you come through something this intense together, whether it be your spouse or a friend. Um, I heard I was listening to a podcast today in which a Lyme patient, an adult Lyme patient said it was his mother. Um, family members don't always understand, but sometimes they do. Who knows where your person is going to come from? I think some people are finding other Lyme patients yeah. through Facebook or on WANA, like the WANA app, the chronic illness app, and they find somebody that they can team up with that kind of gets it. And they have to be a person who is willing to both validate where you're at because you have to stay in your reality and that's the one thing that's really important because a lot of times Lyme patients are told it's all in their head and that's not helpful to get you through what you're going through. But then you also have to have someone like you, Sarah, you sent me a text a few weeks ago when we were trying to keep me out of the hospital and you said, there is a way through this. And that was really helpful too. I think those two messages are really vital at every stage of the Lyme journey. Um, if you have a friend or a loved one who can say all day long to you, I'm so sorry, I feel your pain, I see that you have Lyme, that, that's great. And that is what you need sometimes, but that will only get you so far. You have to have someone with a warrior-like spirit as well who can step in and say, it's, there's going to be a, a way made. Now, we don't know how that way will be made. In the last two or three weeks, David and I had no idea how we were going to keep me out of the hospital how we were going to get an ultrasound I needed. It took four phone calls and David calling instead of me calling to get in to get an ultrasound that we finally got. Yeah. And um, we did keep me out of the hospital, um, but you've got to be super persistent and you've got to believe that if you keep trying, something will open up and... The truth is you have to have imagination because you have to understand that sometimes you think you're at the end of one road, but there could be something even better on the other side of the door that you're standing in front of that has been slammed in your face. And that has happened to me multiple times. It just happened again because I'm getting immunotherapy for Lyme disease. My doctor suddenly retired. He's in another state very hard to find the immunotherapy you need. Um, we didn't, David started calling places in the States by us. None of them could accommodate me. But while he was on the phone, he talked with someone who said, well, I think you could order that through the mail, through this place in this other state. And since you already know your dosage, they could send it directly to you at a cheaper price. And that turned out to be true. Hmm. Wow. <laughs> I'm, 
what are the chances? And it's actually better for me to do it this way than the way I was doing it. But if we didn't stay open to the possibility, we would never would have made the phone calls. I could have gotten into a situation where I was in so much pain. I was bedridden again. Um, so you, yeah, you have to believe that there's actually something out there for you. Yeah. And, you know, we've been, Suzanne and I have been talking about this book by Ryan Holiday called The Obstacle is the Way. And I've read it. It's been a huge tool for me in the last few months um, because it comes at life from a very logical approach in the sense of deal with whatever is blocking you. And as you do that, and it's so frustrating, we've been dealing with Lyme nonstop mm -hmm. for a decade and we're not, yeah. we're not done. And I want to be done. done. And right. last fall, after I'd gone through treatment for the second time out at Invita Medical, I came home. Physically, I'm doing really well. I'm stronger than I've ever been physically. And I'm finally at this place where I'm like, oh, I am really capable of living my this life that I've been working towards for a really long time, growing the business. And my son's health tanks, my 15-year-old who has Lyme. So right. Lyme disease is not sexually transmitted, but it is transmitted from parent to child. So my mm. son, Nate, who is now 15, he's been very healthy since about third grade. He's a freshman now. And he just spent the entire school year being home sick following an oral surgery that had complications. And his health has tanked. My husband's health has tanked. <laughs> And mm -hmm. we've had to make really hard decisions, even within our own family, about, okay, the next level of care and treatment, because it's thousands of dollars. Every step you take is thousands of dollars. And But the thing that has been encouraging to me about that is I feel like it takes, just to honor the reality of what is going on, Takes you have to have a tremendous amount of awareness and strength to say, this is a huge obstacle that we have to get past. And I feel like I just dug myself out of a ton of obstacles or jumped over a hundred hurdles. And now I have to do it again for someone else. And I've been, that's been a hard thing for me to accept because I don't wanna be a caregiver anymore. I don't wanna be yeah. sick. I don't wanna live in this reality. And mm -hmm. yet the only way through once again is to mm -hmm. take that obstacle until it is gone. The only way out is through. And um, it is like, who could have ever imagined, you know, that either one of us would find ourselves in situations where we're battling for our lives or the life of someone in our home. And we're doing it repeatedly. Yeah. And there isn't, there isn't like a sense of let up. You know what I mean? Like, it's not like three months go by and you're like, oh, that was pretty easy three months. Like we were able to kind of coast for a bit, you know, it just that that doesn't happen. There's no coasting. Yeah. Now, there are moments of joy and there are moments of gratitude and hope. And I think we have to, you know, be open to saying I'm going to grab the moments while I'm in the middle of the fight. Um. And I think we have to allow ourselves all sorts of grace about expressing the emotion about the loss of having to go through the stuff again or to even fight it, to cry, to lament, to scream, to go through trauma therapy, EMDR, to draw, um, you know, a, a lot of people may not understand that when you have so little physical, emotional energy and mental energy, that the relational uh, um, things that you you do um, interact in and are a part of have to be clean. Like <laughs> they have to be positive or hopeful or emotionally healthy because you literally don't have any margin for something else. Yeah. You know? Hey, and so you have to make choices that. that people don't always understand. It, but I do think the farther along you go, the less you care about what they think. Yeah. Find that. 
Yeah, uh, totally. And I'm Aaron's putting up an image here. Hopefully people can see it. Yeah, they can see it. Okay. And it says what healing actually, like what healing, what we think healing is, which is meditating in peace, and what mm -hmm. healing actually looks like. And it consists of having difficult conversations, taking radical responsibility for your actions, setting mm -hmm. and enforcing boundaries, implementing healthy routines, and unpacking trauma. That stuff's not fun. <laughs> it's like two full-time jobs, like all that right there. Yeah. Like two full-time jobs. Yeah. It is. And yet, again, the only way out is through. Right. And you do have to find someone, at least find one person in your life who can be there to say, you can do it. You can keep going. Mm-hmm. And mm -hmm. we've heard that so many times through the podcast. People will send us a message and say, you are some of the very few voices in my life that, one, understand what's going on, and two, can say, you can get through it. Mm -hmm. It may make really hard decisions like selling your house or selling mm -hmm. an RV or relocating to another state or living in another state. And those are... Those are decisions that I would have never imagined having to make in my life. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think you 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 grow up in a certain way or um, like for, for me and my family, like maybe lower middle class type of existence. And you mentally in your mind paint, well, you know, I'm going to go do this. If I, go to, I went to college and then I'll go do this and this. And you, it, you don't factor the enormity of a insistent you know, chronic illness into that mix. So what you don't realize is that you can't paint the trajectory or the trajectory of your life out and dictate. We don't have control like we think we do. And Lyme is just a reminder of that. And so then it forces you to ask, what do I have control over every single day and every single hour? And then to do that thing. I have to do that thing. Um, yeah. Well, and you and I have talked a lot about stacking habits. Yeah. And yeah. Because I feel like that's it. I've said it on the podcast before, but about 18 months into juicing and taking supplements and doing colonics and just implementing hours and hours a day into a health routine. And that was all I had. Like I could do the routine most days, but then that was it. Like there was nothing left over. There, there was nothing left in me emotionally after doing all of that stuff. So it came at a tremendous cost. But I remember about 18 months into it, into doing this thing that I didn't want to do that was messy and expensive and time consuming, I realized I had learned something very valuable in the process of just doing this thing that no one saw just for myself every day. Yeah, well, there's there's a there's a theme that's coming up there. And this is something I've been excavating emotionally is like, I never thought that I was worthwhile enough to spend that much time on. I felt a lot of shame that I would have to devote that much time and money and energy to myself. Like I should be smaller. I should occupy less space. Wow. So, yeah. And this is all coming to light now. And that is a pattern that is being broken, my friend. Because it is not true. And so I am learning to take up as much space as I need to to heal. And, you know, what you realize is if I take up, if I do what I'm going to have to do, and it's going to be extreme. Like most people are not going to understand all these home treatments I'm doing and, uh, you know, how David and I are going far and wide to get the right treatments. But I am leaving a pattern for people in my wake. And my goal is to leave healing in my wake. Mm -hmm. So that every person in my life and in my Healing from Lyme support group has a pattern and says, she, she, she said that she was worth this, all of this. She was worth it. And I am worth it, too. See, that's so interesting because we started talking about habit stacking, which you and I has it's saved both of our lives. And we have talked about it extensively. But then we went directly into a topic of worthiness. Totally. It always ends up back with worthiness, though. 
Yeah. And I would have thought I I wouldn't necessarily have said that I was taking up too much space. But of course, when you're consuming tons of resources and time, it's feel. Yeah, there's so much shame that comes up because you don't want that. You I don't want to be a burden. I want to be contributing to my household and our goals. And yet the worthiness factor for me came up when I gave myself permission to just this is if it takes six hours to implement this protocol every day, it takes six hours. Mm -hmm. I'm, am I trying to, to get faster and better? Yes, but that is what it is at the moment and that's okay. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I had to give myself permission to invest in myself. Yeah, and to keep investing in yourself. Yeah. You know, even as you're, you're going to have to be taking care of your son and you're trying to help Aaron. And, you know, it's like when David broke his leg, I was still really sick, but I was helping David. It's like, you know, you continue to invest in one another and that that next right decision. And there's not really good patterns in our world, in our culture of people that are investing on that level because life is precious and life is worth it. Right. Yeah. And so our lives are giving people permission. I believe that. Our lives are giving people permission to say, I've got this shame coming at me from the culture, from my background, from my origin. I am going to come against that. And um, I'm going to create a life where I am valued just because I exist. Like I've been created on purpose for a reason. And I matter because I exist. And my health matters because I exist. I am not worthless. I'm not a throwaway just because I can't be functioning or work right now. Um, and that's a bold thing to do. That that is that's what turns people who are sick like us into warriors that rise up on behalf of other people with so much compassion and understanding and empathy that it's like the sky is the limit. Like I'm looking at our marriage right now and we have just been through it in the last three or four weeks with very few answers on some things. But you know what, we've moved forward. Every week the needle has moved forward to the point where we finally looked at each other and I just said to David, I said, I can't wait to see what the next 12 years brings. Mm -hmm. Because if we went through this in the last four years, I don't know what we're gonna do, but it's gonna be big. And I don't mean big like we're gonna go out and you know um, earn a million dollars, I mean, there's going to be impact. There's going to be meaning because um, we don't give up and we don't give in, you know. <sighs> so how much of that have you had to foster yourself? How much of that I am going? How much of those mindsets have you had to foster yourself? And mm -hmm. like to me, that's just been the thing that. I remember getting to the point where my neuropathy was so bad that I would have to sit with my feet up and here I have five little kids. I'd have to sit with my feet up every afternoon because that's when it would kind of hit in. And mm -hmm. if I could sit with my feet up for two or three hours, it would go away to some extent to the point where I could get up and keep doing stuff. But to me, the I have had to pull strength from so many different sources because of what we are up against. And, yeah. and it was so confusing to not understand and to have this thing that's continually with you that I felt like I had to learn how to, one, feed myself, which was just purely taking care of myself and knowing I was doing my due diligence to get to the next level. And then two, like yeah. borrowing courage from whoever I could. And it was a lot of authors. It was documentaries. It was people that weren't really in my life because I didn't have a lot of people who knew Lyme. But yeah. how much of that for you has been just this internal game that you've had to learn to play at a whole new level? Yeah. You know, I had symptoms of Lyme when I was born. And I don't know if I've ever told you that or not, but um, my feet were both swollen and my uh, left foot went down immediately and my right foot has always remained swollen to this day and so eventually when I was they just couldn't figure out what it was and um, 
eventually when I got diagnosed with Lyme, even though they'd already done a lot of tests, they kind of deduced that there had been infections in the, the right lymph nodes at the top of my leg when I was born. It was the only thing that we can really make sense of it. We don't know what, what which infections they were, but my leg is actually getting better now after 47 years now I'm treating my Lyme. So I grew up with a disability. Um, I also grew up in a, um, a re- in a religious background um, as a pastor's daughter. Um, they gave me a very specific set of ways of looking at my worthiness um, and at God and what I was worth, whether I was worth much to him or to others. And um, in some ways, it was very damaging. And in other ways, um, it provided an introduction into me discovering, eventually discovering my worthiness. So as I got older and I started to read, I'm a real reader and a learner, and I never, I always want to learn more. I started digging into that more and started realizing, you know, I was going to have to come up with a faith that I, number one, believed in, like, (laughs) I actually believe this is true. And number two, it's going to have to work. It's going to have to work. I'm going to have to feel that I belong, that I've been created on purpose, that um, it brings joy and life to me and to others. And so I've had to fight really hard over the years, just very gradually to come to that place. And have had discoveries along the way and I'm still having discoveries, but I just am not willing to give up. So part of it is internal resource, but I grew up with a literal limp. You know what I mean? Like I grew up feeling like I was the outsider. Like I'm not like all the other children. I don't know why I have this issue. Um, I was able to work and to get around, but it was always like impeding what I really wanted to do. Like you can't go on this trip or you can't do this. And so that combination of things over a period of many years, um, there, there was a certain amount of strength, um, that I was able to see in, um, people who are marginalized or have some kind of disability or illness. And so I think I, you know, I just feel like so many of the pieces of my journey are now being filled in with Lyme disease and with healing from it. And I'm going so deep emotionally. So it is a personal journey, but, but, um, my therapist and my friends and my husband, um, and my Lyme group, (laughs) um, they speak so much truth and courage into me that, um, I am choosing actively each day and and very, very much on purpose to take in those messages and think on them and believe them. And then my feelings follow my thoughts. Mm. So over a period of time, I'm still in process. I'm still working on it. But this does get easier. I want people to know that on the Lyme journey. In a certain respect, you have to start dealing with physical things first before the emotional and the spiritual and mental can, you can move forward, but, but you can start by changing what you're listening to and believing and, and it will start sinking deep down in and it, and it will yield benefits. I can attest to that, Suzanne. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. You can change the way you think. I've had to re-examine on a deep, deep level. And it's amazing how deep some of those thoughts and some of those actions are like, you, yes. you hear one word and you act this way. And, mm-hmm. and, and to not do that is extremely difficult. You have to be extremely brave and honest with yourself. Which yes. is hard to do. And, right? and, and you, um, it's a process. And I, I, I just even today was reminding myself, I'm going to give myself some grace in this process. And I was talking to David about it because I want to be the same person in every setting I'm in, in, in therapy or in um, spiritual work, they call that integration. So whoever that is that you're becoming with the discoveries that you're learning in your life that you could walk in, you know, just something with your family or something with this group and the other group, you may not say the same things in every situation, but you're going to be the same person. You're not going to try to please every group, right? That's exhausting. And that is a recipe for burnout. And so 
I, I would say like with you, Aaron, it's like my long term goal is integration and to give myself space to integrate, you know, and then every person I meet, I have so much more grace for them than I did at the beginning of my journey. I, um, I see them as another person that's trying to learn and they're trying to grow and they're struggling through. And so I have much more ability to let them be where they're at. Um, Can I ask you a question, Suzanne? Yeah, sure. Now, what you've described is unique. Your attitude is very unique. There's some yeah. people that go the opposite. They go real negative. Right. What are the choices? Why did you choose to go positive instead of negative? I think at some point on the journey, I have been a person that always pulls herself back up after hard things happen. But at some point on the journey, I did realize that this was about me either living or dying. Mm. And I didn't, I couldn't stay in the limbo place of shame and of feeling like I was occupying too much space and I shouldn't be sick and I shouldn't need this and I shouldn't need that. It was too painful for me to stay there. I either wanted to die or I wanted to really live. Yeah. And I think and I expressed, I expressed that to David. I said, you need to let me go. Mm. And um, he's like, no, I don't want to let you go. We're going to try to fight through this. So we, we both decided and I told him I would try. You know, I would do everything I could and he's done everything he can. <laughs> and here we are. Yeah. We are a lot farther down the path because we just decided that life, life mattered. And I was right. going to try to choose life. Well, and there's such a difference between living and existing. And I think for me, like I existed for so long that I'm like, I can never go back there. And, and won't, I won't. And we've talked about it a lot. Yeah. Like, even as we've come out of my major reinfection and different things, I'm like, I want my life to look differently than it would have because of what was lost, right? because of what was learned. And because you do realize life is very short. And those moments of living, one, you got to create them on a daily basis for your own well-being. But you yeah. have, to, like, truly living, not existing, not enduring, not being put in a box you don't want to be in. It's right. a daily choice. Yeah, yeah. There, there, it's, a, it's a freedom that you start to taste like, oh, could I step into that freedom? Could I do that. And then when you start going down the path and you're like, Oh, I think I am going to live or, Oh, I think we are going to make it, or we're going to be able to make it through this financial crisis or that emotional thing. It's kind of like you build a little bit of steam and we'll even talk about it when things have come up. And I know you guys went through a thing where you had multiple things going on, you know, within short windows of time. How is it that seven things are happening? You know what I mean? It's just like mind boggling. And we will remind each other of what we've already come through. We will say, you know, remember when this was like this and then this happened and this happened and we got through it. And um, even when I hear from both of you and I realize what you've gotten through, anytime I hear from someone and they're like, this is where I was at, but then I was able to realize this truth and eventually this happened and now I'm here. It inspires you to keep going. And I think what's really required long term to get through these things is an openness to good possibilities happening and an openness to people. Because, um, you know, we've met like online and then like people in our neighborhood, I've realized we need them. They may not even know I have Lyme or they know I do, but they don't understand it. We still need them in our lives. Like we still want to wave at them and be like, Hey, how are you today? And have a genuine interaction with someone like don't discount any of the interactions that you have or the people placed in your life. You know, they're there for a reason. And so just like really working on openness to change, openness to growth, 
openness to a door or a window opening that was not your plan, but maybe it's going to lead you somewhere. It's going to help. It's going to, it's going to bring you through. And so there's like this weird flexibility that you develop. <laughs> oh, I like um, that. It that is a weird flexibility. Is yeah. It's odd. I mean, it's like you try to explain it to other people and they're like, what is happening? Like, what are you going through? And then and you're like, well, that's just how it is. And we don't know, but somehow it, it will will come through that to the other side. And we're trusting, we believe, and we have faith to do that. We don't know anything about how that will happen. But we'll just do what we can do today. And then we'll just keep going. Um, aren't those the best kind of people, though? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the people that you want to have at a dinner party are not like the ones that had everything go right in life. Right. And like, they were handed like a golden platter and like, here you go. And or, uh, you know, the other dad handed down a business and they never had a sick day in their life. No, the people you want at a dinner party for meaningful conversation are the ones who have endured and persevered. Yeah. They've made hard choices. But um, they discovered love in the middle of chaos. And they are they are like people that bring love with them. They don't bring the negative energy into the room. They've developed the ability over a period of years to bring the positive and the good and the delightful and hopeful. Yeah. And we don't feel that every day of the year. No, we're going to express our emotions. But these are the people we're becoming. We're becoming the people that you would want to invite to a dinner party. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> yeah, that is good. Yeah, you're right. It hard lessons learned in extreme circumstances. That's what I've really liked about this book. The obstacle is the way is it's just filled with story after story of people who have gone through incredibly difficult things and we we feel like we're we are in the midst of dealing with some really hard things because we need to put Nate through some type of treatment and Aaron is dealing with a bunch of Crohn's stuff and he needs to do some type of treatment and all of hey, which hip laws. Come on. all of which are very expensive <laughs> and then we're juggling uh, we have a daughter with a bunch of mental health needs and her needs are different than their needs and trying to meet all those needs and still be a family and run a business and do all those things and and, and yet hide from the coronavirus and hide from the coronavirus right <laughs> and yet right those, in the middle yeah those really it does make you weirdly flexible in the sense of you have to be okay with uncertainty and unknowns and yet having that inner courage to be like no this is the route we're headed down because this is what we need to do next yeah I feel I feel um I feel that courage rising mm -hmm. I do um I feel more capable of I guess we learn it first with our doctors you know we go for years with doctors thinking well I can't tell them anything they know what they're talking about they know what my diagnosis should be when in reality, they're, they're trying to help, but they don't know. And uh, so we first maybe learn to speak up there because we realize that our lives are at stake. And maybe that's the first place we start speaking up. And then we go from there and we build out, you know, with relationships, like who am I supposed to be and what is this supposed to be about? And what's my life supposed to look like? And we start developing those courage muscles and we have ripples for sure, but they, they just grow stronger over time. Um, we can become who we really are. We can be who we are and be okay with that um, and take joy. And um, so we look for ways, uh, those like I was talking about, moments of joy in the week because sometimes it just feels like all we're doing is treatments um, and juicing, coffee enemas and ozone and you know all these things. So we have a shaved ice um, truck that, that uh, like a food truck that, you know, coronavirus or whatever. <laughs> there are not a lot of food trucks around, but they're going to different neighborhoods and you can like schedule a time for them to come to your neighborhood. And so David hooked them up. They're going to be in our driveway at 545 tomorrow. Oh, fun. 
fun. And it's going to be 77 degrees in Indiana. And um, we can social distance with chairs six feet apart. So we've got our little three-year-old friends coming over and um, another um, friend that is um, healing from Lyme and a few people. um, And we're all going to, it's like kind of a fairly healthy version of a shaved ice. So we're all going to be doing that in the sunshine tomorrow. And I told David, I said, you know, those are the things, that's us fighting back. Mm. against all of the hard and bad things or or the um, obstacles in the last three or four weeks. That's us saying that doesn't define our life. There are still choices we get to make. And what could that look like? Um, And so that's what it looks like tomorrow. Um, And then so every week, it's almost like we ask ourselves, what could we do this week that we could look forward to that would actually be something that would bring some kind of joy, you know? Yeah. 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 Wow. It's immense. It's immense. Mm -hmm. It is immense. And I'm so glad we're on the journey together and that, um, that we can both validate and encourage each other that somehow, even though we don't know how there is a way through the latest obstacle And we're not going to give up. We're going to keep developing the courage muscles, keep validating and honoring one another and walk into our worthiness, Mm -hmm. you know, and be a light for other people that really need light, too. Um, It's a good journey, even though it's a hard one. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. Well, thank you for being with us today. I loved it. I can't see you still, but I've been (laughs) picturing you the whole time, so. (laughs) It's good. <laughs> we'll see if we can get that fixed for next time. I'm still working out all the bugs on this new software, but we're hoping to do more of these mm-hmm. um, and have different guests on. And, and, and then if people want to have questions, if they can please post those. Um, but yeah, it was really good to have you on today, Suzanne. This is the pickup we needed. Oh, good. Me too. I always love connecting with you guys. Keep up the good work and and we'll talk soon, I'm sure. All right. All right. Thanks, Suzanne.